Welcome to a really fun episode of the Praying Christian Women podcast. I get to be here with Trisha Goyer, who is, she told me not to say this, but she is a USA Today bestselling author. She's written over 70 books. She's a wife, mom, and author. And um, we're going to be talking today specifically about her most recent book. And what is your release date for this book, Trisha? November 5th. November 5th. So really soon coming out. And it's called The Grumble Free Year. 12, mouth, 12, 12, mouths, 12 months, 11 family members, and one impossible goal. So I'm really excited to sit down and talk about this because I just read it myself. I got a preview and it is it hit home in so many ways. So thank you for being here, Tricia. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I love connecting with you. Well, so uh, some people may not know, Alana and I actually had a podcast before the Praying Christian Women podcast called the Prevailing Prayer Podcast, which was a little bit more, uh, we had a lot of segments of different kinds of prayer. And we used your book, Prayers That Changed History. And we love that book. And I just want to give it a shout out right now. We're not going to go in depth about it, but it is, it, we use that on the podcast regularly for um, talking about people in history and the way that the, the prayers, and many of them I didn't even realize were Christians, much less had prayers that changed history. So um, it's a really great homeschooling resource. It's a great, just good read. <laughs> so yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I love that book. And I love just sharing the stories. And you're right, there's so many of my, I was like, I cannot believe people don't know about this part of history and these oh. prayers that surrounded it. Yeah, I loved it. So yeah, for anyone out there interested in just inspiration about how people that you'll know, like of all of these people and, and how prayers in their lives changed history. Very cool. Well, I want to start with um, a just for fun question before we dig into your book. Um, we ask our guests usually to tell us what is your favorite prayer closet? Where's the place that you like to go to connect with God? Yeah, there's two places actually. So I like to get up early in the morning and um, I go just this corner of the couch with a little coffee table. I make some tea and that's where I read my Bible and pray and journal. Um, so that's like when I have peace in the morning before everyone wakes up. But also even during the day, the laundry room, <laughs> um, when I'm folding laundry, like kids don't seem to bother me when I'm in there folding piles of laundry. So when I'm you know, pulling out their clothes, I like to pray for the kids and um, you know, pr just pray for just different things going on in our lives. So those are kind of my two places. The laundry room, you know, I could do it throughout the day. Um, when, whenever things get busy, it's like, let me just slip away in here. No one bothers me there. It's because they're afraid you're going to invite them to help, right? Oh, I do. If they come <laughs> in there. <laughs> the same with the kitchen. I don't think that we've had laundry room. We've had several rooms in the house, but I love that because as you're folding, you have that physical reminder of the child or your husband or yourself or grandma or whatever to, to be able to pray for. Well, yes. that's a, that is a great segue into my first question is tell us a little bit about your family and why you have to get up so early in the morning to get quiet time. Yeah, so John and I have been married almost 30 years, and then we have 10 kids. Um, so actually, I was a teen mom, and I had my oldest son before um, I met Mary John. And so here I was, senior year of high school, found myself pregnant and really dedicated my life to God um, during that pregnancy. And, you know, I grown up in church, but had teen years, I just did my own thing. And I started praying for a future husband. Um, and God brought me John. And so we got married when Corey was a baby. And then um, we had two more kids right away. And I thought, this is it. I'm done. Um, and then after those kids were almost out of the house, we felt called to adoption. So first we adopted a baby just from a direct placement. Um, and then we adopted two more from foster care and then a sibling group um, of four from foster care. They were all preteen and teen girls. And that was just finalized in 2016. So we, we almost raised three, then we started the baby and then adopted teenagers. Like totally everything's out of birth order, but it's definitely the family that God had planned for us. We just, we're just going along with them along the way. Well, I love that. And after reading your book, I feel like I know your family. I want to ask these questions about yeah. them. Now, are those, I don't know if you even want to answer this, but I'm just wondering, are those your actual kids' names or pseudonyms or does it? Does no, it yeah, happen? we did. We did use pseudonyms for the book. Yeah, um, I thought maybe you would. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I feel like I know Alexis and, you know, yeah. I, <laughs> the oldest, so your oldest, I'm so your oldest, your youngest biological child was the oldest child in your home when you began this, 
journey, yes. right, of the, yeah. of the grumble free year. Yep, and that's his real name. It's Nathan. So, okay, so Nathan yeah. is not protected. Yeah. No, he's fine. He was like, yeah, you can put my name in there. Yeah, for the, and there's no stories. I mean, the kids all read the book and gave me approval, but, you know, just, I don't know, they're young. I just wanted to make sure that no one later would say, mom, I can't believe you wrote that about me. So we, right. just, we just changed the name just for that. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's really good. Well, um, how did this book come about? You talk about it in the book itself, but let our listeners know what made you decide to write this book and, and begin this experiment. Yeah, well, John and I, um, you know, we really just kind of look at our kids and figure out like, what do they need and spiritually and emotionally. And we had gone through so much anger and dealing with trauma. And um, I mean, a lot of slam doors and tantrums and deep depressions and all the stuff that our kids were going through. And we finally got to a place where like that was mostly in the past. I mean, they're still angry outbursts once in a while, but the big stuff was past us, but we noticed this constant grumbling. Um, it would just be, you know, everyone's discontent. And every time we tell someone to, or ask someone to go do their chore, they'd be grumbling. And we really noticed it when we were, um, we went on a road trip from Little Rock to Seattle and I was going to speak there and we took our kids and when we got there, we're like, okay, we have to do something. <laughs> like we just been in the car for over 2000 miles with all these people and just attitudes. Like we just needed to work on something. And we had been talking about this for a while. And so we said, you know, what if we tried to go a year without grumbling? And some kids were like, that would never happen. And some kids are like, yes, let's <laughs> do it. You know, just they're totally different personalities. Um, but we said, you know, it's all something we all need to work on. Like even mom and dad and my husband ended up talking about the Israelites in the desert, like God had done so much for them, but they were still grumbling. And it even says in there, because of their grumbling, I think it's num number 14, because of their grumbling, they did not get to enter the promised land mm -hmm. because they were so focused on what they didn't have or their daily struggles that they forgot that like God delivered them from slavery and did all these miracles. And that just becomes us. Like God has brought all these kids together and he's unified us as a family. And we've overcome so many big obstacles, but it's the grumbling that's really getting to us. And so we, we told them we'd take them on a family trip and they would do it, you know, just to motivate them. Cause we know a year is a long time. It's a big effort to do this. And we, they're like, okay, they all, bought in and then um, we started when we got back home we started really working on memorizing scripture and doing different things that would help them and teach them um, and really it was that stuff was helpful but really the stuff that was unexpected during the year that happened ended up kind of being the big teaching moments yeah and i loved that and i also really like the fact that you know you talk about some of the the outbursts the the large behavioral issues that you know some of it stemmed from past trauma for some of your adopted kids um some of it is probably just people and yeah exactly dealing with that though a lot of times i think in our own lives we you know just will look at those things as the things we need to deal with. And in your book, you talk about how this grumbling spirit is kind of the root issue of a lot of the outward stuff that comes out, you know, and, and dealing with that and getting to the heart. And we'll talk more about that later. You had some really fun stories about like, you know, not dealing with external things, but more to the heart. But I just, yeah, that, that spoke to me is, you know, trying to dig deeper into the heart of right. the issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what would you say in your own life, have you, and in your kids, just as you began this journey, what did you identify as some of the sources of grumbling just for all of us? Yeah. And I think the source of the grumbling really are our own discontent hearts and our own feelings like um, things should go better. We have, un, we have unrealistic expectations where we think, okay, you know, I, and I don't even know why I thought this because, you know, when I just had three kids and they were older, I cleaned the house and it pretty much would stay clean. Well, then we adopted seven kids and I still expected like the house would stay clean. And so <laughs> I would be grumbling about that. I'd be grumbling about them leaving their shoes around or just their attitudes, which a lot of stuff, like they weren't trained knowing how to do these things. So I was expecting them to like act like my older kids who were trained in our home, who knew how to do different things and they weren't. And so because I was expecting something and it wasn't happening, I just found myself in this horrible cycle of grumbling and I can't do this and of being overwhelmed. And then I think with the kids, um, you know, even though they, they, a lot of them talk about praying about being adopted, now they're in a family, you still have all the dailiness and all the struggles and all the people. And so I think when we have those expect, unrealistic expectations, it really um, just makes it hard for all of us 
to see the good in what's happening because it's always like not good enough and we're not doing enough. Yeah, I definitely agree. Would you be willing to share the story from the book about your old boyfriend and that contact that you had that and just kind of what you learned from that? Yeah. So when we started doing this, I mean, at first I thought like, we're going to do this activity and we're going to memorize this first. And God's like, we need to really look at your heart first and what's going on there. And um, it made me think about like, what was the background of my, my grumbling? Like, how did I learn how to grumble or not grumble? And growing up, my, my family, they weren't yelling at each other. They weren't even fighting. Um, but it was the, the grumbling, like, oh, I wish someone would help me in the kitchen, or that must be nice to go on a vacation. So it was that discontent, but we're not like yelling at each other. So I just thought like, this is the way we communicate. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, I'd been married years and my husband and I were having preteens and teens and I just get, you know, got busy with work. He got busy with, you know, his work and we, then we had teenagers and I, I found myself in that same rut of, oh, wow, I wish someone would, um, you know, do something for me or just feeling like I wasn't talking to my family about that. Like I would wish people could help me clean the house or help me cook dinner. It was just that underlying discontent was there. And I didn't even realize it until out of the blue, an old boyfriend ended up emailing me and it was like my very first boyfriend and you know, that old whole romantic love thing you think you have when you're younger. Mm -hmm. And he's like, how are you doing? I'm like, fine. Like, I'm just trying to, you know, I'm married. So I'm just trying to keep it like totally. I'm this, I have kids, I'm a writer. And which now looking back, I shouldn't have even written him back. But then he's like, oh, and, and it, I knew it was almost like the enemy knowing where my weak spot was because like out of the blue, he says, I bet they don't treat you like you deserve to be treated. And, you know, I bet they don't help you out. And it sounds like you're carrying a lot. And all of a sudden I'm like, yeah, yeah, I am. I am like feeling like no one treats me right or gives me the, the help I need. And it was like, all of a sudden that d discontent grew into like, wow, here's someone that appreciates me, which is just ridiculous because he doesn't even know me. Like it had been 20 years <laughs> since we had dated, but right. that, that feeling really stirred something in me. And I had to, I mean, first I went to my, I, um, some writer friends that we've just been prayer partners for years. I'm like, guys, I just have this, like this, this uh, drawn, I'm being drawn to this old boyfriend, like just through this email and just pray for me and that this will stop. And I ended up talking to my husband and confessing to him, but it really, and, and then I broke off all communication, but it really showed me inside. Like if that, even just that short time when we were communicating back and forth, if that was able to stir that within me, like, yeah, I don't feel appreciated. I had to do something different. Like I couldn't keep this mm -hmm. all inside. And, and John and I really had some good conversations about that. Um, about like, why don't I tell him if I need help? Or why don't we talk about these things? And I, I had never really, I didn't grow up like that. So it was really hard for me to go, hey, I'm really busy tonight. Do you think you could put dinner in the oven for me? I mean, that, even that was a huge hard thing for me because I was just so used to kind of being a martyr and carrying it all and then grumbling about it. So looking back, when we started this year, looking back, I realized I was kind of getting into the same habits again, where we have all these kids, I don't want to ask for help, you know, I'm just trying to do what God called me to do. But it made me realize, like, I need to get back to communicating with my husband, communicating with my kids about like, hey, guys, I need some help here, because it is a lot for one person to tackle all the kids and then writing and speaking. So um, God, as we were going through this, was just kind of like reminding me of of lessons that I needed to learn, lessons that I had learned that I needed to be reminded of, and really looking at myself and the role model I needed to be, because I can't tell my kids, do this, um, you know, have open communication, ask for help instead of grumbling about it, if I was not being a role model for them. As I read your book and I got to the part about the martyr complex and all of that, I was, I was speaking out loud. I was reading at that point, I was getting my oil changed and I think I, I had left and I went into my car and I started it up and then I, I just had to keep reading. And I, I read that and I was speaking out loud. I was like, oh, Trisha, I hear you girl. <laughs> like, I mean, I related so, so directly to that. And just that idea of not expressing your needs and yet expecting them to be met. And that is, I think that's so huge. And that's something I struggle with too, is just not, not expressing my needs, expecting that magically someone's going to come and figure it out. And, and that's not the way it works. And I thought that was really great 
how you illustrated that in, in several points in the book. Um, and I think that's definitely a, a step that I'm, I need to take and that, that the book has inspired me to take. Um, and I also, I also really liked, you talked a little bit about your husband and just how by expressing yourself and having these conversations, you were able to make progress with, mm -hmm. with the grumbling issue. But there's this other side of the coin. What is, what would you say is, is there a difference between grumbling and just venting and being honest? Like, what do you think that balance is? Like, is there a difference or right. where, where's the line? Yeah. And I think really it is, the difference is what is our motivation? <laughs> like, what is our motivation to it? So are we, um, cause you know, there is times when, I mean, just today I'm trying to talk with my, you know, talk with my husband and we have kids that are dyslexic and we're trying to find good therapy for them. And there's a place that we can go, but it's a 45 minute drive. So, you know, I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to be able to do this with when I'm homeschooling and taking the kids there. And so then he's, well, maybe I could ask my boss if I could go to work later and then um, in the morning and then work later that evening. So we're communicating, like I have a need. Um, I, I, have, I need to be two places. I need to be home homeschooling some kids and another place taking kids to therapy. And so there's a need there, but it's a different thing than you know, I'm communicating a need compared to, oh my goodness, this is so overwhelming. You know, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I mean, that would be grumbling. And it's still, I would be letting my husband know about the problem, but it really is, am, am I communicating to find a solution and to work with someone, or am I just trying to vent and get it out and make people feel sorry for me or just to let those emotions up out? And mm -hmm. so I think there is a huge difference. Um, and even with our kids, I mean, there could be me grumbling about, hey, you never sleep your room clean and blah, 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 blah. Or I could say, you know what, my kids, someday we're going to have their own house. So I need to train them. And so we're going to work on this together. I mean, there's, it's a completely different thing. So really, what are we trying to achieve? Are we trying to, um, to work with someone, help someone, you know, work together to solve a problem? Or are we just trying to tell, let someone know how unhappy we are with the situation? Yeah. And I think what I've caught myself doing um, is that I will grumble is grumbling is kind of a, a lazy way out. Mm -hmm because I will, I'll, I'll kind of grumble or mutter under my breath to my kids. But like you said, then I'll, then I'll think, well, you know what, I, I can grumble and be passive aggressive about this and play the martyr, or I could train them up to do the right thing. And that's, you know, and I love the exercise that you kind of um, illustrated in the book of naming the thing that you mm -hmm. are tempted to grumble about, not just ignoring it, but naming the thing you're tempted to grumble about and then flipping that coin and saying something positive. So I don't know. Can you give an example of what that might look like? Okay. Now I need to think about it. I know. <laughs> okay. Well, we went, well, even like with, with chores. Mm -hmm. um, so we could say, you know, we, I mean, we are overwhelmed because there's all the dishes, all the laundry. So we could say, okay, the chores seem to be a lot, but we are thankful because we can work together as a team. So we could like focus on the teamwork and supporting each other and being thankful for each other instead of like just focusing um, on the chores. And so I think anything that we do, and then, then also like coming up with the solution, and that was one of the things that helped me too, was writing down the things that do need a change, like oh, that I we do that. struggle with, yeah. And yes. then finding like what is one little solution that can help instead of just like your mind is like, this house is always such a mess all the time. I don't know what we're going to do. My friend um, actually said like, write down the problems on one side. And then what would one solution be? Well, one solution, which is, would be a chore chart. So we, I ended up writing, it took me like 20 minutes. I wrote up this chore chart. I laminated it. It's the same one we've had on the wall now for three years. And it has worked instead of me like just grumbling and complaining and overwhelmed all the time. It's like, here is a small solution towards that. And sometimes the first even idea you come up with isn't the solution, but once you start looking at solutions and set and let your mind just replay over and over what's wrong, once you start looking at solutions, your mind will start working. And it's like, oh, well, we could do this too. Or what if we did this? Um, you know, when we are just stuck in that rut of complaining and grumbling, then nothing will ever change. But once we take steps to, to be proactive, to think of a different solution, to be thankful for, you know, even if it's something that's a challenge, challenging, then it can switch our brain over and it, it turns it to what we could be doing instead of what we're stuck in. Yeah. And in the book, you kind of draw a picture of that, of like your, your negative thoughts about certain things 
literally digging a rut as they play mm -hmm. over and over and over and you just can't get out of it. And so you have to flip that switch. So I yeah. see like two different really valuable exercises there. I think the first one is just practical of if you have a problem that bugs you, that makes you grumble or tempted to grumble, to make a list of those things that are really wearing you down and then divide your you know, paper in half and write one solution or start thinking. And then the other one pertaining to prayer, which is definitely what we want to draw out because we're a prayer podcast, yes. <laughs> is, is Thanksgiving. And, mm -hmm. and I, I, you know, Alana has talked about with her family, they really encourage their kids. You know, one of her kids struggles with, um, he gets tummy aches a lot from, they thought it was from maybe gluten, but he just gets stomach issues. And so when he'll pray, he'll say, you know, God, thank you that even though I have a tummy ache, um, I was able to eat such and such a thing and it was mm. really good or, you know, but training them to take their, I won't even say complaints, but take their, the things that bother them to God, but then also, you know, acknowledge it. Yes. But either find something positive about it or something positive instead of it or in addition to it. And I think that's that kind of Thanksgiving. And I think even in the book, you even say, the opposite of grumbling is Thanksgiving. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Thanksgiving and gratitude. And that really is not just enough to stop grumbling. <laughs> it, we need to replace right. that with Absolutely. thanking God and praising him and having gratitude. You know, I mean, I could grumble because I always have piles of laundry in my laundry room. Like it's just, we have a lot of people. We always have piles of laundry. My friend the other day is like, you have a laundry room. I would love to have a laundry room. I just have a closet in my hall. And I'm like, <laughs> See, this is it. I mean, I'm grumbling because there's laundry in the laundry room, but I have a laundry room that I could pile stuff in. And she has a hall that gets you know, stuff piled on. So I think anything we can just look and say thankful. Like, God, I am so thankful. I have a laundry room that I could shut the door on, even though there's piles in there. And we have clean clothes to wear. Like, we're wearing clean clothes. It's all good. We'll get to that. And I think so many times um, that's one thing that a phrase like, I have nothing to complain about. And that's one thing I have to tell myself over and over as we're, we're going through this. Like, I really, I don't have anything to complain about. Yes, there's struggles. Yes, there's a lot of work having this big of a family. Yes, there's unexpected things that happen. But really, God has done so much for me. He has done so much for our family. I really don't have anything to complain about. Yeah, and going along with that, I loved this quote. Um, our thoughts are just thoughts, not facts. They're just a story we're telling ourselves. Mm -hmm. So. I think those tools are ways that we can change our story. Um, how ha have you encouraged your kids to do that? What are some practical ways that you've been able to take what you're learning or what you have learned and help your kids to do that same thing? Has it been harder or easier than you thought? Yeah, I mean, it's always a challenge because I think our kids are always faced with different things that happen. And as they grow mature, they have new experiences. And so that the idea that our thoughts are just thoughts, not facts, and that's what we're telling ourselves. So for example, this year, um, our kids, two of our kids, a 12 year old and uh, our nine, he just turned nine, um, started basketball for the first time in a homeschool basketball thing. So then they're like, I'm the only one that doesn't know how to play. And everyone's going to look at me and everyone's going to make fun of me. And you know, so it gets to be grumbling. And I'm like, guys, Okay, let's, let's think about this. You guys are getting a new op opportunity. Let's think about you're going to make friends. And you are, yes, you're learning, but everyone knows that, that you're learning and they're going to help you and your coach is going to help you and you get to learn new skills. And so really instead of taking it off of, you know, them feeling like I'm not going to do a good job, it's like you have an opportunity to learn and you have an opportunity to make friends. And sure enough, you know, just turning that around even before we go in, to, you know, because they wanted to go, but then when they get there, they're like nervous, like wondering what's going to happen. So really just reminding them like, this is going to be a great opportunity and you're going to build friendships. You're going to le learn new skills and let's focus on that. It's like, okay, it's not, you know, everyone's going to look at me and everyone's going to make fun of me, which I think kids are prone to do that, especially if they're nervous about something or anxious about something. I mean, every stage and every age, there's new things they're trying, there's new things they're doing and they can kind of get stuck in that anxiety. So just helping them to turn their thoughts around to like, that's not the true story. Let's, let's think about how we could think about this um, in a way that we can be thankful for it instead of grumbling about it. That's great. Um, Another thing that I pulled out on page 28 of the book, I don't know if it'll be, so I got the pre preview copy. I don't remember yeah. what it is, but 
Is it, are the pages going to be the same? I don't know. Much? Cause I haven't got like the final copy yet. <laughs> so oh. I don't know. I'll be curious to know too. <laughs> yeah, and just for anyone. Okay. So I can't see, I gotta get my notes out, but this is, so here's a picture. This is, I love this cover. I love that cover of the book. So this is a, this, whoops, my pen fell out. Um, but yeah, that's a picture of the book itself, which I think is really neat. But on page, let's see, lost my place. Page 28, this, this really resonated with me. The root of grumbling is desiring to feel, feel powerful while truly feeling powerless. I just, that resonated with me because I think back to the times when I grumble the loudest when I get the most frustrated and I feel the most paralyzed by my discontentment and it's because I feel powerless and I really want to feel powerful. Mm -hmm. So what role has surrender played in, in your own quest to stop grumbling? Like, and how does that look in our prayer lives? Yeah, that is so good. So I think like when I, like you said, when I'm grumbling the loudest, it's because I don't feel like anyone's listening to me. So I'm going to grumble. And then, then if I grumble loud enough, all my kids will jump to the tension and then they'll try to right. do the things that I want them to it do. Then I'm so like, bad. yeah, because yeah, they're like, oh no, we, we're going to get in trouble now. I better, <laughs> I better do this. But it is powerless because I'm, I'm basically manipulating them to do what I want and I'm not training them to do what, you know, to do what they need to do. And so it, it has come back to kind of the surrender of me going before God and saying, okay, these are some of the things that we're working on. And then either I'm going to train my kids. There's some things I definitely need to do to train my kids, but there's some things I just need to realize, like, I'm going to surrender this because we are a big family and this is what we're doing. Or, you know, even with work stuff, it's like, I can only do what I can do. I can only write, you know, what I have time to write when I'm squeezing in different things. And I just surrender God that if you want me to have this book done, it'll get done. And I surrender that you have control of my schedule. And, and you know, my grandma ended up breaking her back in the middle of this. And that, I mean, that was, that took a lot of time to care for her and to um, wake up during the night and be with her. But, you know, I'm like, God, you know, everything I need to do, but you know that you call us to care for the orphans and the widows. So I'm just going to be here and I'm just going to surrender myself to you. And the more that I realize, like God knows, God sees, God cares, and he just wants to love others through me, then I don't get so worried about all the things. I don't get so worried about, um, you know, having my deadlines and wanting to get things done. And I'm trying to make the house look perfect. It's all about God. I'm just going to love the people that you place before me. And it really, it is those times of prayer where, you know, I come and I'm feeling like, oh, there's so much to do in my life or there's so many worries that I have. And it's like, okay, God, you know it all. You know all my worries. And here you go. Just take them and then change my heart. And then I, that is like the times where I, you know, walk, get up and go about my day with so much more peace and joy, knowing like he knows, and I don't need to worry about all these things. And the things in light of eternity, like these things, often these things don't even matter when it comes to eternity and what God has for us and just loving these kids and telling them about God, which they never would have had that, you know, if we hadn't adopted them. So it's just focusing on what really matters. Yeah. And even in your book, you describe this time where you had several offers or maybe one contract offer for mm -hmm. several books, like a multiple book offer. And you realize that you had to turn it down just because of, of logistics of life and, and kids and everything. Yeah. And you were tempted to grumble and feel sad about that. But then it turns out your grandma broke her back mm -hmm. and you need, you couldn't have done it. I mean, it no. just would not have been able to happen. And so, I mean, God even went before you there in that choice because you surrendered. And I just, I love that. That was just a neat kind of, we don't always get the God view. We don't always right. get to see why things don't happen or, or he leads us to, to a direction that we don't really understand. We don't always know why, but in that case you did. And it really yeah. proved his sovereignty. Yeah. And yeah, it was a three book contract well, three books and then a novella. And I'm mm -hmm. thinking, of course, I love writing for them. This is so fun. And it is a fun break for me. And even though I'm squeezing it in, it is like, I get to explore my creative side, you know, and, and get, you know, create characters and all that stuff. And I woke up in the middle of the night, like after you know the day before I'd like, yes, I would love to write for you. And it was just this feeling like such a heavy burden, like you didn't pray about it. And it's a no, like, and so I literally in the middle of the night, it was just like, I just knew it was a no. And I just got up and like, emailed my agent and my editor. I'm like, I'm sorry. I know I told you yesterday I could, but I just feel like God is saying, no, I cannot do this. Yeah. And it was two months later. 
my grandma broke my back. Like there would be no way I could have worked on those things. And just, I'm so thankful that God, um, you know, is gonna, and, and I could have like said, oh, it's just my mind or I'm just making it up or that's not really God, <laughs> you know? but just like, just, I just knew it was him. And he was saying, this is not the books and this is not the season. And, you know, I'm, my grandma's 90 now, like how many years am I going to have with her? I don't know. You know, there'll be plenty of years later to write books, but he gave me this opportunity to care for her and love on her during a time when she needed it. Yeah. And I had to ask how grandma is because I feel like I know yeah. her read this book yeah. and, you know, and I wanted you to share about, um, well, first tell us how she's doing. Yeah, she's doing really good. And, you know, she broke her back and um, she ended up having surgery like three months later and a lot of rehabilitation, a lot of therapists coming to the house. And now she is up and around in her walker and you would never know that, that she had a broken back. And she doesn't remember. In fact, the first um, doctor's appointment was like a month and a half after her surgery. They're just checking on things. And she turns to the doctor. She's like, what am I here for? And he's like, you had reconstructive surgery on your back and she's like I did well I don't remember I'm fine can we go home now <laughs> I mean she just she just doesn't and so like she can completely forgot about her broken back and all the things and so she just putters around the house and goes and sometimes we have a like our our living room and kitchen and then there's a hall it makes a big loop and sometimes she'll just be walking the loop and I'm like she doesn't realize like it's a miracle that she's even walking right now yeah, at 90. I mean, how old at was she 90. when she had the surgery? She was um, 88. 88. Yeah, 87 or 88. Yeah, right around wow. there. Yeah. yeah, God is very good. <laughs> yes, he is. So you have this. This made me laugh out loud when I read this on uh, about grandma. You said that grumbling doesn't stop. You just gave an example of how yeah. she had grumbled about something. Grumbling yeah. doesn't stop just because you're older than scotch tape, stop action photography, and parking meters. <laughs> I love that. Um but, you know, you had this, this kind of contrast, though, because you had, yes, she still does grumble at times. But then on the other side, you had this story about her and just her heart of praise that mm -hmm. by just practicing praise as a lifestyle, even as an older woman, and even though she struggles with dementia, you know, that she, that's her go-to. Yeah. And so you, because she has dementia... Um, she didn't remember that her back was broken, like even when it was broken. And so we had to put an alarm in there. And so in the middle of the night, I have to get up multiple times. I'm like, you can't get out of bed. You know, and we had a potty chair, right? And she's like, I don't want to use that. I'm like, well, <laughs> you have to we'd put on your brace and I need to help you. You know, she just didn't understand how injured she was. Mm -hmm. um, but we, our homeschool room is right next to her bedroom. And so even though she's like, in pain so she knew she was in pain she just didn't know what was going on she'd be in pain she'd be laying there and we would just hear her praising god over and over mm -hmm. she'd be singing songs and singing hymns and she didn't become a christian until she was in her 40s but after that like she was all she's always been like always singing and when she's cooking and praising god and anytime anytime you say how are you doing i'm blessed you know <laughs> we go on there how are you doing grandma i'm blessed and so we're thinking i'm thinking like that came out even though she's in pain. She doesn't understand why she can't get out of bed. She hardwired herself after all those years and years and years of praising God. Like that's what naturally came out of her. Like she wasn't laying there complaining and griping all day um, that she couldn't get up or couldn't do anything. She's just praising Jesus, even though she doesn't fully understand like why she's laying in bed and why her back hurts. Um, and just reminded me like, and we told, I told the kids, I'm like, listen to that. Like, we complain because we're out of jelly for our peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And she's in there praising Jesus with a broken back. And it just reminded me, like, whatever we do over and over and over again, that is going to be our natural, what we're hardwired to do later. When things get tough, that's what's going to come out. And out of her, it came praise. Like, sometimes she will grumble about a little thing. But when it came down to it, like, what usually comes out is praise. Yeah, I've thought about that many times. If, you know, if I ever got to the point where I did not remember things and, and you're kind of the things that are coming out are just what are in you. It's not that you're planning them or guarding your words because I'm a very guarded person. I mean, I'm, I'm a people pleaser. I want to gauge how people are reacting to what I say. I don't want to say the wrong thing. And I think if I ever got to that point, what would come out of me? And yeah. that's a huge motivator for me just personally to think, I love the way you put that. And that's even the title of one of your chapters is hardwired for praise. And I just mm -hmm. think, yeah, like if I can hardwire myself not to grumble, hardwire myself to praise, 
how much easier, you know, and it's probably, I mean, like any habit, it's going to be hard in the beginning. It's going to take intentionality, but I would just love to get to that point of being hardwired. <laughs> yeah. And she wasn't raised in a Christian home. Like she became a Christian and as a you know middle-aged adult, but over yeah. and over again, that's what she got into her. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. still there. Yeah. Well, we touched on this earlier, but you talk a lot about how in the beginning of this project, of this year-long, you know, grumble-free year experiment, you were focusing on outward things, which, I mean, some of the outward things were good, memorizing scripture, talking through, you know, some of the reasons we grumble, and, but then you got to, to a point, and you illustrate it kind of with the gratitude jar. Could you tell us about how you shifted from outward focus to just going straight to the heart? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when I first sat down, like, we're going to do this, and we're going to keep track of it, and we're going to pay attention to all the things that we're doing to grow in gratitude, I came up with all these ideas, and one of them is a gratitude jar. And so the idea was, whenever the kids got caught grumbling, that they would have to go and write something they were thankful for. So the first time, you know, I talked to the kids about this, and they're like, okay. You know, they, I mean, they didn't seem very thrilled about it. <laughs> they, they're like, okay, we'll do this. Well, the first time I called one of my daughters to do a chore, she was grumbling about it. And I'm like, well, you're grumbling, so why don't you go write a gratitude? I don't want to write a stupid gratitude. <laughs> and she's in a grumpy mood. And so I'm following down the stairs. Well, that's going to be two things you need to write. And by the time we got from her room into the kitchen where the gratitude jar was, she was up to nine things because she just kept grumbling about it. And I realized, like, we cannot make someone be thankful if they're in a grumbly bad mood. I mean, that just doesn't work. Um, so instead, in fact, the kids helped me come up with this idea because that didn't work. Like she's like, all right, I'll write nine things. And she was scribbling and just throwing in that. I'm like, that did not work. But <laughs> instead, if we are already thankful, we're already talking about God, like we're reading our Bible together in the morning, when we already have that um, hearts of thanks to write things down. And so that's when we started writing things down. They're like, can we get the jar out? As we're, you know, sitting there reading through a Psalm, we're like, God is so amazing. They're like, can we get the jar out and write things? I'm like, yes. So that made sense. Like, instead of trying to switch someone when they're already grateful, just to capture those things. And as we're going along, I realized like I am trying to get them to do all these things outwardly, but really I need, I'm dependent on God. I need God to help me and they need God to help them. And so I talked about then the fruits of the spirit, like the fruit of the spirit, the love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, all those things come from God in us. And we could try, like we've been trying to do this gratitude thing instead of grumbling and we can only go so far. But when we turn to God, when we ask him to change us from the inside out, when we ask him to change our heart and when we depend on him for strength, that's when things change. And so we would talk about that and how, you know, they're like, I just don't know. I can't do this. And we're like, God can help you. And so I remember, especially one girl every morning when we had a little prayer time, prayer time, she would start praying for the fruit of the spirit in her, that God would change her heart and would make her want to do the right things and help her to do the right things. I'm like, that is it. Like all through life, we're going to be facing stuff. We're going to be facing challenges. Like someday they're going to be out of my home and I'm not going to be there to sit there and remind them, okay, we don't grumble or remind them about different things, but they can, if they learn now to depend on God's spirit to help them, like that is going to be the true place where their heart's going to be able to transform and they are going to be able to do these things which aren't possible in our own strength. Yeah. And that's, that is such a, I don't know, it's just such an important thing to remember is they're not going to have necessarily the structure of the external inputs, but once you draw out that internal um, gratitude or, or harness it when it, when, when they start, it's almost like when they start, you gain momentum by, you know, using their thankful energy and, and going with it and, and kind of drawing it out of them more. And I just, I really liked how you did that and, and how that is going to cultivate something that they can take with them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, can you talk about the contrast? You talked a little bit about Christmas and how difficult it was transitioning from, for your kids that were adopted, transfer, transitioning from the foster care system, Christmas gift situation to the adoption gift situation, and then kind of like contrasting that to the gratitude Christmas that you talk about when grandma had just gotten back from the hospital. Yeah. So one thing, I mean, foster care is not fun. And our girls were in foster care for eight years and they've been in shelters. They've been, in, they've been separated. They've been moved around. They've been in homes. They had a failed adoption. 
they lived in a children's home, which is like almost like an orphanage with in different cabins. I mean, they've been through all different things. And so it's a hard way to grow up when you have so much change all the time. But the one thing that really, I guess, was the benefit is at Christmas, they really got spoiled <laughs> because a lot of people, a lot of organizations, um, that's the time that they want to draw kids' names and do different things for them. So the kids were used to at Christmas, they'd be able to have a list. So they wanted a new Kindle, a new iPod, new headphones, a sleeping bag, suitcases, this doll. I mean, they would make a list and pretty much through the different organizations, they would get everything they wanted on the list. And so now we've, you know, adopted all these kids. Um, first of all, they cost a lot of money just caring for them. Right. And so they gave me the list. I'm like, um, you know, you're not going to get all the things on this list, right? <coughs> Sorry about that. And they were kind of shocked, like, what do you mean? We're not going to get all the things. I'm like, you might get like one or two of these things, but we have a big family and we have a lot of people we're buying for. And so that was, you know, kind of a shocker for them. And they said, um, well, can you call DHS and still see if we get presents for them? I'm like, you're not going to get presents. But they kept pounding me. And finally, I ended up calling and they're like, social workers like, no, they're yours. Like, they don't get presents from us anymore. I'm like, I told them that, but they just, just insisted. Checking. Just yeah. checking. Um, and so... Plus, this was also the year that grandma in, injured herself and we, I was at the hospital. So I was up there with her, you know, five days. I had people helping me with the kids. And so I'm not even doing the shopping and doing everything that's normal. And I remember, you know, before the, the first year we had them, almost like after they opened the presents, they're like, is that all? <laughs> like, you know, this is all we got. And I'm like, hey, guys, I mean, this is all we can afford. But mm -hmm. that year, it was the next year that they're like, grandma's home. We know you've been busy. It's okay. And they were just so thankful that we were all together and that grandma was home and she was okay. And I was you know, back with her from the hospital that they did have gratitude. And that, that just goes to show, like, first of all, that we'd been working on being grateful and we'd been you know, talking about it, that they were starting to see, and, th and they were starting to see also the benefits of, like, we're in a family now, and this is all mommy and daddy can afford, <laughs> instead of, no, you know, just having this list of things, so I think all of us were growing in gratitude in different ways, and just having our home, it was like, okay, we feel okay, even though we don't have those pile of gifts that we used to get, we have grandma here, we have mom's back, you know, from the hospital, and we have each other, and I think that really began to show up during that year. Yeah. And in that year, I mean, you early in the year you had, you know, you got off to a good start, but then when your grandmother got, got injured and, and then in the hospital, you had said you did not, you didn't have time to work on gratitude yeah. as, uh, intentionally. And yet God knew he heard your heart to bring gratitude to your family. And it's like, you said that Christmas, you just realized I, I hadn't been able to bake like before yeah. we didn't have all the traditional, you know, bells and whistles and and yet god had blessed you and blessed your efforts at, at yeah. cultivating gratitude just without you having to do a thing and i loved that that was you know just just a reminder to us that that it's not um you know there are these hard things that we want to tackle and when we lay them at god's feet it it might not come back in the way we think but he knows our hearts and he's going to bless us and bless our our efforts to become more like Christ and, and yeah. to offer that to our families. So absolutely. Yeah. So this other thing, I think I was talking out loud at home at this point in the book <laughs> saying, Trisha, like, do you have video cameras in my house? <laughs> <laughs> you said, um, your kids had a build a bear incident and you don't have to go through that whole thing. I think people need some really fun stories to, to read in the book for themselves. There's this really, really neat story. But, but you quoted to them, just remember, true character is shown when we're tired or disappointed. And boy, can I, that hit so hard because I, I had just had an incident where I was really short with the kids and I was tired. Mm -hmm. And I even remember it crossed my mind, like, you know, being tired is not an excuse to, to allow these words to come out and to allow this grumbling and this attitude to come out. And I just reflected back on that and thought, it, it is true, like true character is shown when things aren't going great. Um, you had a lot of sleepless nights with your grandma um, getting up with that alarm more than a newborn. Mm -hmm. His mom probably would have gotten up with a child. And so can you share some of those struggles with extreme fatigue and, and how 
just what advice you would give women that are in the same boat with either um, sleepless nights from newborns or aging parents or, or chronic illness or pain? Like, how do you, how do you do it? <laughs> yeah. And I think that is so hard. And the moment that you're talking about, it is like, everyone's tired. Everyone's exhausted. Like we had a right to grumble, but in that moment, I'm like, okay, we could turn this around. It's like, in my mind, I thought if I grumble about the situation, everyone's going to have a meltdown. But if I remind them, like, we have a lot to be great, grateful for and look at, look for those good things um, that we have, that we, you know, have each other, that God has, you know, given us this life and this day, we can turn it around. And it, it is taking that moment and pausing and breathing and saying, okay, how can I turn this around? How can I be thankful? Even if I'm exhausted, even if um, I don't feel like being happy or, you know, or, or trying to lead my children. And the thing is, that's the hard thing is we're trying to lead our families in the midst of being tired, but mm -hmm. they're, they're not going to see um, the only way they can see how we can do things differently is if we model it. So for me, it is like stay, stopping and praying like, God, help me in the moment, give me the strength, show me something to be thankful for and help me to turn the situation around so that I can, I can tell my kids like how to praise God, even during hard stuff. And it is, it is so hard. I mean, there is times when all I can do was like, okay, we're just going to praise God or we're going to read a Psalm. And, you know, I don't have a lot that I could pour out to you right now, but we're just going to thank God for this day. And our kids will pick up on that. And it, it isn't like there's no magic pill we can take. There's nothing. It is, it's literally just pausing and saying, how can I fix my eyes on God and what he's done, even though I'm tired and exhausted. And this is a really hard situation. Well, and I could see that being even more powerful, maybe even than having it all together and being able to be thankful and, and praising God is to be honest with your kids mm -hmm. and say, you know, mm -hmm. I'm not feeling this, but scripture knows, like, let's go to scripture. But I, you know, we, I need to be thankful, even though I'm not feeling well, even though I haven't slept all night, let's, let's go to God. Or even after a failure, you know, I've had mm -hmm. so many where I've just looked back and thought, oh, I wish I could change that. But just being honest and saying, I made a mistake, should have handled it better. Let's go to God now. I think that could be so powerful. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Um, let's see. Uh, I think the last question before we kind of close up is just in general, how do you see prayer as fitting in to combating grumbling and, and moving forward? What do you see as the role of prayer in all of that? Yeah, I think prayer is what is where we find our strength to con to control our grumbling and to turn our heart around. Um, I cannot do it on my own strength. I need God every day. I need him to help with my kids. I need him to even know how to lead and model for my kids. And so it is when we go to God and when we're in his word, and I think that's an important part too, is when we are in his word and see that there's people in there that struggle. And then there's people in there that turn it around and even in their struggle, praise God and are, you know, say, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be discouraged. I'm going to continue to um, believe in God, that will make a difference in our lives. And we've been studying the book of Daniel, me and my kids. And so even, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, um, you know, we, we've been studying that and they were faced with the fiery furnace because they would not worship another God, but they said, God can deliver me. But even if he doesn't, um, you know, we still will praise the most high. And I think that's in our lives. Like God can turn around the situation. He could turn around our day. He could turn around whatever is going on, but even if he doesn't, doesn't even in this moment, I could just praise him and trust him that um, that he is good. Like he is good in our lives, and when we teach that for our kids, because the truth is, like we can pray, and not every single one of the things they pray for are going to be answered. Mm -hmm. um, they're not always going to have, you know, everything's going to wrap up in a tidy bow, and things are going to get better. But even if we can still thank God that he is good and that he is in our lives. And I think that is kind of the, the most important thing when it comes to prayer is um, it's not like we're giving God a list, but we're just trusting him that he can help us. And sometimes he changes the situations and sometimes he just gives me peace that I can have peace even during the hard times. 
Yeah. I think of that Christmas list thing is yes. a really good, really good parallel to that. You know, he's not going to give you everything that you put on your Christmas list for, you know, yeah. your iPod or iPad or whatever. But yeah, that's, that's really good. Um, well, where can listeners find your book? So it's up for pre-order now as of yeah. right now when this airs. So where can they find your book? Yeah. Um, the website is just the grumble and there's information about the book. You can see a picture of our family. All the kids okay. are there. Okay. And grandma, there's a picture of grandma too. Um, and then if people pre-order, we do have some um, free things for them. So I have a 60-day um, printable gratitude journal that they can do and write in as a family. And then there's um, color sheets. The color sheets actually use for my kids. It has scriptures that we memorize. So, um, you know, in every, do everything without grumbling or complaining, you know, all these scriptures that I'm like, okay, we're printing this up, we're coloring this. I compiled those all together and they're on there. And then some screen locks because all of us touch our phones a thousand times a day. So screen locks, photos on there with little quotes that can just remind us not to grumble. Um, so those are free if you pre-order, but all the information about the Grumble Free Year is at thegrumblefreeyear.com. And then I'm on social media everywhere just as Trisha Goyer um, and my website is just Trisha Goyer so and I love connecting with people and just encouraging them um, and I know like a lot of people say I don't know I don't think our family could do it just remember like if you make one tiny little progress every day you know at the end of the year and I think that was the whole thing like at the end of the year I was able to say wow we have really changed even when I was editing the book I'm like oh we don't do that anymore we you know I, my, my children don't complain every time I tell them to go to their chores but it was a, a process and so don't feel like, you know, you're going to wake up tomorrow and you're going to do it perfectly and then your kids aren't going to grumble. But really, anything we do, when we focus on God and we focus on um, making positive changes by the end of the year, it's amazing what God can do in and through us. That's great. Amen. So, and that's Trisha Goyer, T-R-I-C-I-A, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Trisha Goyer. Um, well, great. Well, how can we, I'm going to close us with prayer and I'm going to pray for you. So how can we be praying for you today, Trisha? Yeah. I mean, our, our current struggles are, um, our three youngest kids have dyslexia. And so just finding the right therapy and the right help, you know, I've been a homeschooling mom for many years and I'm, you know, at the point where I'm like, I don't know what to do and get the right therapist and stuff. So we would just love prayer for that. Okay. Well, let's pray. God, we just thank you so much for this time to get together. We thank you for Trisha and her willingness to go through this year-long experiment um, that, that is going to benefit so many people. Lord, I just ask that you would bless her. She would bless her writing, bless her family and her marriage. And we just pray, Lord, that you would lead her to exactly the right resources that she needs to help her kids with dyslexia and that you would encourage those kids too, God. I pray that they would have hope, that they would have joy as they tackle this obstacle. Um, we just pray your blessing over their family, God. And we pray for grandma that you would help her to just continue to praise you and continue to have joy and, and preserve her health. And we just thank you so much for that pretty much miraculous healing of her back and her surgery. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Trisha, for being thank with us. Thank you, Jamie.